Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country. It is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, makes our country more, not less, American. America, at its best, matches a commitment to principle with a concern for civility. A civil society demands from each of us goodwill and respect, fair dealing, and forgiveness. America at its best is also courageous. We must show courage in a time of blessing by confronting problems instead of passing them on to future generations. America at its best is compassionate. Where there is suffering, there is duty. Americans in need are not strangers. They are citizens, not problems, but priorities. And all of us are diminished when any are hopeless. America at its best is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Our public interest depends on private character, on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency, which give direction to our freedom. What you do is as important as anything government does. I ask you to seek a common good beyond your comfort, to defend needed reforms against easy attacks, to serve your nation beginning with your neighbor. I ask you to be citizens, citizens not spectators, citizens not subjects, responsible citizens building communities of service and a nation of character. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, Ken Hirsch. Good afternoon. I'm Ken Hirsch, the president of the Bush Center. I'm taking my mask off, putting on my Purell, and telling you that I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of the pandemic. I'm tired of social distancing, I'm tired of Zoom. But most of all, I'm tired of the dysfunction, the, disvice, the divisiveness, and the pessimism that has gripped our country. That's why I am really excited to be back on this stage for the 2020 Forum on Leadership here at the Bush Center highlighting America at its best. Even if it's an abbreviated session in a hybrid format, I welcome those who are here live, safely spaced at the Bush Center, and those watching online. Collectively, this audience represents our supporters from across the country, and we're so grateful for your investment in our work. This forum is a very important part of our mission to engage communities in the US and around the world by developing leaders, advancing policy, and taking action to address today's most pressing challenges. And special thanks to our lead sponsors, Palantir, the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, Caliber Home Loans, Bank of America, Texas de Brazil, BMO Financial, La Quinta by Wyndham, and FlexJet. And despite our format, our messages of being a strong and compassionate country, an advocate for economic and political freedom, and a proponent for less government dependency are no less important these are foundational elements of President and Mrs. Bush's public service, which inspire everything we do today. In fact, I would argue that they're even more important than ever. And today we have the opportunity to, to celebrate leadership consistent with these values. You know, we've entered a world where personal responsibility is critical, given that the forces around us seem so intent upon taking that responsibility away. Not only are government programs and payments and subsidies supporting just about every facet of American life, it seems like almost everything we come in contact with today has an element striving to manage us. I call this the era of dueling curators. It's us versus the algorithms. 
If we do not curate our own life, others will do it for us. And those are likely driven by computers with artificial intelligence and machine learning. Think about it. Now that this pandemic has thrust us all in front of our own devices, the algorithms behind our search engines, our social media, our news, our shopping, even our entertainment, lead us around the cyber world like a child being, being led around the zoo. And it isn't, it isn't just marketers skillfully merchandising our grocery selections at the end of an aisle. The infinite space of the internet feeds us what we like to see, and once clicked, it gives us more. Unlike a store where we're limited by our budget, or in my case, how many packages of Oreos I can hold at once, the internet has no limit. It will feed us items beyond our saturation point, defined by those algorithms. And it is not their job to say when or to ensure that we're getting the full story. These self-reinforcing loops create the entrenchment and create seemingly tribal groupthink. In addition, machine alter videos and photos, or deep fakes as they're known, circulate wildly and call into question, can we even believe what we see? While nefarious actors like the Chinese behind TikTok actually use the algorithms to manipulate our behavior. But being our own personal curator can break this dynamic. We have the power and now the responsibility to curate our own lives. In our news and information, you know, networks and their major news outlets used to curate this for us and we could sit back and watch. And we relied upon their fact checking and their confirmations of sources. Those days are gone. While there are some very responsible news organizations remaining, there are so many that outnumber those who push out unverified stories or those with questionable sources. We can't just outsource that curatorial function anymore. In our social circles, the Black Lives Matters movement has laid bare how many of us have curated our own social circles in narrow ways, missing the systemic racism that was all around us. And finally, in our community, we can no longer be anonymous spectators. We all have a profile. Even if social media is just used to post and watch vacation videos or film or photos, our electronic fingerprints are everywhere. And our life is being curated and our personal brand is out there, whether we define it or not, which is why we can't be passive anymore. So it begs the question, what voices will you open yourself up to hearing? And what is your personal brand that you are curating? It's critical to accept that responsibility of being a responsible curator for your own life and its content. And to do that well, it's important to maintain values, values of compassion and mutual respect, the curiosity to seek out facts, and the intellectual honesty to change your mind if new facts emerge, while maintaining a clear sense of right and wrong. These are the traits exemplified by President George W. Bush and Mrs. Laura Bush in their life. And they pers personify the compassion, the mutual respect, the civility, and the honor for the truth. And for that example, we're grateful. Thank you. Now, curating your own life is hard, especially given these forces that are conspiring against it, which requires, so it requires critical thinking st skills derived from a high quality education, which brings us to tonight's program. Education has been the priority of the Bush's public service from his tenure as governor of Texas through the, the, to the signing of the No Child Left Behind legislation, which was a signature piece of legislation in his presidency. Mrs. Bush has also been a champion for reading and literacy throughout her career, both at the State House and during the term in the White House. We continue that today with the Bush, at the Bush Institute with the Laura Bush Foundation and the Laura Bush Endowment for Education and Literacy. And tonight we have the honor of celebrating leadership in education. It's an honor tonight to recognize Dr. Michael Sorrell, the inspirational president of Paul Quinn College here in town. And under his watch, he has transformed that school and changed lives. Also, it's an honor to recognize my friend Wendy Kopp as the third recipient of the George W. Bush Medal for Distinguished Leadership, following Bono and Bill and Melinda Gates. She has dedicated her life to education in the US and around the world, and has had as much impact on children worldwide as just about any person on the planet. But first, we get to celebrate freedom. And now it's my pleasure to turn the stage over to Lindsay Lloyd, the Bradford M. Freeman Director of the Human Freedom Initiative at the Bush Institute, who will recognize liberty in North Korea 
for being a champion of human rights. Thank you and enjoy the program. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. As Ken said, I'm Lindsay Lloyd. I manage our Human Freedom Initiative here at the Bush Center. Uh, tonight, it's my privilege to award the third annual Bush Institute Citation. At the Bush Institute, we are guided and inspired by the principles and the beliefs of President and Mrs. Bush. We believe that freedom is a universal human right and that it's key to having lasting peace and prosperity. Our Human Freedom Initiative works to advance freedom by developing leaders in emerging democracies, by standing with those who are still living under tyranny, and by fostering policy, excuse me, fostering American leadership through policy and action. We believe that extending freedom helps secure benefits for those of us here in America for the long term. Nowhere is this truer or more needed than in North Korea. When we hear about North Korea on the news, most of the time it's about the security threat that they pose to their neighbors and to the world. But we firmly believe that the other North Korea story, that of human rights, needs to get equal attention. We also believe that a successful American policy towards North Korea must integrate those security issues and human rights issues. When we began our work on North Korea a few years ago, we were privileged to learn from and partner with a remarkable organization, Liberty in North Korea, also known as LINK, and its president and CEO, Hannah Song. Central to LINK's mission is reminding the world of the humanity of the North Korean people. LINK focuses on people, not on politics. They help North Koreans find new freedom in South Korea and in the United States through an underground network of organizations and individuals, they literally rescue people. To date, they've helped more than 1,000 North Koreans build new lives and freedom. Among them, the Bush Institute's own Joseph Kim, one of my colleagues on the human freedom team. To complement the good work of LINK, four years ago, we established the North Korea Freedom Scholarship. This supports higher education for refugees who have resettled permanently here in the United States. A number of them are uh, rescues of LINK. Now I'd like to invite you to turn your attention to a short video that will give you a little bit more insight into this remarkable organization. It's been called the Red Box, a mysterious country infamous for its nuclear weapons and dictators. It looks hopeless and unchanging, a ruthless regime ruling through fear and oppression, unlike any other place on the planet. But that North Korea isn't the whole story anymore. And that's because of the North Korean people. They're shaking up the status quo and challenging the regime's control. They know that liberty will not be given. It must be won. And so do we. We're a global movement working with the North Korean people. This movement isn't about high sounding words. It's about action and momentum. It's about seeing the North Korean people achieve their liberty. Because every refugee we rescue, every North Korean empowered to speak up, and every person who demands freedom for the people means liberty is no longer impossible. It is inevitable. And together, we're one step closer to the day when every man, woman, and child in North Korea is free. Welcome to the movement. So now it's my distinct honor to award the George W. Bush Institute Citation to Liberty in North Korea. I'll read it for you. Liberty in North Korea, with unwavering dedication, aims to bring safety and freedom to those who have escaped the brutally repressive North Korean regime. Its work shines light where darkness reigns and honors the inherent right of human freedom for all. On this day, September 24, 2020, let it be recognized that Liberty in North Korea is cited for its com commitment to human rights and its efforts to stand with the people of North Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannah Song, the president and CEO of LINK. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Good evening, President and Mrs. Bush, staff of the Bush Institute, distinguished guests, it is with the utmost gratitude that I accept this citation on behalf of Liberty in North Korea staff, 
partners, and North Korean friends around the world who have worked tirelessly over the years. It is an even greater honor to be receiving this recognition from President and Mrs. Bush, who have championed the cause of North Korean human rights and have brought much deserved attention to the struggle and the potential of the North Korean people. In 2004, President Bush signed into law the North Korean Human Rights Act, which opened the door for North Korean refugees to resettle here in the United States and begin their new lives in freedom. It made it possible for individuals like my friends Chung Hyuk and Young Ae to come to America to work hard, become business owners, and start a family. I think about how vastly different their children's lives will be because of the dangers that their parents endured escaping North Korea and the sacrifices that they made to reach freedom. I think about Hyung Young, who just became an American citizen last month and said that she finally feels like she has a country. Helping North Korean refugees reach freedom is truly a privilege and we are so grateful to our North Korean friends for entrusting their lives to us in this work. What we do as an organization would not be possible without their incredible bravery or without the support of thousands of supporters around the world standing alongside our North Korean friends, investing in their protection and in their future. We are inspired by this global movement of everyday moms and dads, teenagers and grandparents. Our link chapters around the world from California to Massachusetts, South Korea to Brazil, at high schools and colleges where students raise money by selling everything from boba to fried Oreos. This movement has made it possible to fund the rescues of over 1,000 North Korean refugees. Together we share a bold vision and a belief that there is a day that is coming when every North Korean man, woman, and child will live free and full lives. When North Koreans can freely travel the world and we can also freely visit North Korea. When students can choose what they want to study and teenagers can enjoy foreign music and movies without fear of punishment. When men's lives won't be based on loyalty to a brutal regime and women can speak freely for justice when the North Korean people have achieved their liberty and the end of isolation from the rest of humanity. We accept this citation with immense gratitude, but also the knowledge that there is still much work to be done. Thank you, President and Mrs. Bush, for your incredible commitment to the North Korean people. It is an honor to work alongside you and our friends at the Bush Institute, supporting our North Korean friends in their pursuit of freedom. We look forward to the day when the North Korean people achieve their liberty. And when that day comes, we hope that you will invite us to join you on your private flight to North Korea so that we may celebrate with 25 million people. Thank you. Paul Quinn College is a movement. Our mission, the reason why we exist, is to prepare our students to join us in the fight to eradicate poverty. We understand that we stand on the shoulders of giants, so we do not get the choice to be small. The only way that we can fulfill the promises that those giants made and the dreams that they had for this country is to band together and address the issues of the day. The number one issue of this day is poverty. For the first time in America's history, the majority of its students come from poverty. Therefore, the true measure of our success in higher education will now be our ability to serve the poor. If you grow up in poverty, if your life is defined by scarcity, you don't have the luxury of time. Our students are the roses that grow from concrete, and those roses need us to walk in their gardens, not in ivory towers. The most important innovations, even in higher education, are those that move people out of poverty. That is why we've created our own version of higher education. We are the world's first urban work college. We created an academic program called Reality-Based Education, so students can see how the things they're learning in class are relevant to their everyday lives. We created the Urban Work College model because our students needed not just to have an education, but to have the skills to succeed for a lifetime. Work colleges are distinctive in that students are required to work in addition to go to class, and that work becomes an integral part of their academic experience. Our students graduate with an academic transcript and a work transcript. 
Because of the work program, our students also graduate with jobs. They graduate with the skills, with the ability to do things that will permanently move themselves out of poverty. Let me tell you a little bit about my students at Paul Quinn College. 85% of them are Pell Grant eligible. 70% of them have zero expected family contributions. 98% of my students are either African American or Latino. We are a national institution where over 40% of our students come from outside of the state of Texas. Another 20% come from outside the city of Dallas. So what we're doing every single year is asking ourselves these questions. Are we getting it right? Are we serving our students in the best way possible? Are we being good stewards of their faith? Are we raising the bar? You do that by making sure you're addressing their needs and the needs of the communities that produce them. We knew that our community was in a food desert. We were closer to the city's garbage dump than we were a grocery store. So we transformed our football field into an organic farm, which now includes a 5,000 square foot greenhouse, as wonderful as our now is, our next must always be greater than our now. So when people come here and they're like, I want to be a nurse, he's going to be like, but why not a doctor? And that's the type of mindset that you have to have. People should look at you as if you're a little bit crazy because your dream is so big. If you actually want to make change, then this is the place for you. My dream is to end poverty. I've been told you can't end poverty. You can just make a dent in it. Listen, I pity those individuals who are the souls that don't dream big enough that they want to solve the great problems of our society. People who are crazy enough to believe that they can change the world, they're the ones who do change the world. This is who we are. This is what we do. Welcome to the Quinai Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Laura Bush. Well, my role, of course, is to uh, recognize uh, Michael Sorrell with the Trailblazer Award. But I think you can see from the video how terrific he is and what he's done here. He's the 34th president of Paul Quinn College, a four-year liberal and arts-inspired college that was founded in 1872 by a group of African Methodist Episcopal Church preachers. The school's original purpose was to educate freed slaves and their children. Paul Quinn College is right here in Dallas in, as President, President Sorrell says, a neighborhood that's filled with good people who've been underserved. When President Sorrell became president of the college in 2007, it had about 30 days of cash on hand and it faced a loss of accreditation. Very few of its students graduated in four years. Enrollment was slipping and morale was low. Buildings were abandoned. The college had about 18 months left before it would be for forced to close its doors. But President Sorrell is a man with a plan, as you can tell from that video. He knew that a thriving Paul Quinn College would mean better opportunities for the graduates and for the community. So he went to work rebuilding the school to meet the needs of its students, to make sure that more students could afford to graduate. President Sorrell cut tuition costs and turned Paul Quinn into a work school, one of only nine in the nation and the first in an urban environment. At a work school, students work 10 to 15 hours a week to help pay for the cost of college, and it's paid off. Paul Quinn students graduate with less than $10,000 in student debt, compared to nearly $30,000, which is the national average. This gives Paul Quinn students a head start toward a better future. President Sorrell eliminated the college's football program, you saw it, so the field could be converted into an organic farm operated by Paul Quinn students. Since 2010, they've sold and donated more than 30,000 pounds of organic produce to the surrounding community, including to customers like the Dallas Cowboys. Maybe that's why the Cowboys pulled off that win on Sunday night. 13 years after taking the helm, President Sorrell has reinvented higher education to meet the needs of under-resourced students and communities. He's turned Paul Quinn College into a national model focused on academic rigor, experiential learning, and entrepreneurship. And most important, 
he's invested in the character of Paul Quinn students. The school's ethos, we over me, centers the need of the community over the needs of the individuals. President Sorrell has encouraged his students to become leaders in service, ambitious young trailblazers who will make a positive difference for our community and for our country. When we interviewed Paul, uh, President Sorrell for Listening to Leaders, a book on leadership published by the Bush Institute, he told us that his goal is to use education and its relationship to job creation and wealth creation to end poverty. He said, poverty robs you of the ability to dream in full color, to just live a life with dignity. Well, President Sorrell, you've made dreams come true at Paul Quinn, and you've changed the life of countless students. We're grateful for your service, and we're thrilled to present you with a well-deserved honor, the 2020 Trailblazer Award. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very you much, Mrs. Bush. You've done terrific work for our community. We thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I would first like to thank President Bush and Mrs. Bush. Uh, this is an incredible honor, one which I am humbled to receive. Uh, I want to always recognize my friend Gerald Turner and his wonderful wife, Gail, who have been incredibly kind and gracious to myself, my school, my family. Um, they were one of the first people who, uh, once I became a college president, when they went to dinner with us, and I asked them for some advice. And gave me great advice. He said, when you're with the company of people of means, ask them for something, <laughs> right? I have listened to that advice time and time again. Thank you for that. I also want to recognize my beautiful wife, Natalie, um, who just is an inspiration in all that I do. Um, let me just say very quickly, we are an institution that lives by our values. We live by our principles. We believe in something very, very simple. We believe in the edict of we over me. The needs of a community must always supersede the wants of an individual. In our world, we don't get to behave selfishly. We believe in the idea of the common good. The common good is based on an idea of decency, that what you do affects me, what I do affects you. Therefore, we should do things that benefit each other. We believe in compassion. We believe in the idea that my success does not take away from yours, that there is more than enough for all of us. We believe in the idea that we can lift each other up, that we can succeed together. When you come from the places that my students come from, not enough people see you. Not enough people understand what it's like to grow up and be robbed of the ability to do simple things simply. Not enough people understand that you don't need a handout, you just need an opportunity to compete. Our work program, the very basis of our institution, provides those students with an opportunity to compete. And once they are in the game, what happens next is up to them. And I'm proud to talk about their successes. I'm proud to see them stand up and lift not just themselves out of poverty, but their families out of poverty. I'm also very, very proud of the relationship that we have with our wonderful partner, SMU. For almost a decade, actually more than a decade, um, SMU has allowed our students to take courses here. And that may seem like a simple thing, but the best part of it is, our students get to pay Paul Quinn prices, which are slightly lower than SMU's prices. All right? But that is made possible through the generosity of President Turner and this institution recognizing that we are all in this together. So as I prepare to take my seat, let me just say this to you. Thank you. 
Thank you for believing in the notion of who we can be as a country. Thank you for modeling the behavior that benefits all of us. And that is especially true for you, President Bush, because I remember when you were governor of Texas and you talked about compassionate conservatism, and then you went out and lived that and you set that example. I, I wish everyone followed that example, but I will leave that alone for today, right? <laughs> My point is this, we are one country. We are one country. We may not love all of our brothers and sisters, but we are stuck with all of our brothers and sisters. So we might as well learn how to get along together. I am committed to that principle. I am proud to lead an institution that is committed to that principle. And I am proud to have a wonderful partner like SMU and the Bush Center that also believes in those principles. Thank you for the honor of this citation. Thank you for recognizing our work. And I leave you with this one simple promise. We are just warming up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the George W. Bush Foundation Board of Directors, Don Evans. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, wow, what amazing stories. Uh, Hannah Song and Liberty in North Korea and Dr. Sorrell, just, uh, just wonderful, amazing work. And uh, just, you know, what leadership will really do, you've shown it in a big way. So thank you for that. Look, it's an absolute pleasure to be with all of you today and all of you that are here in person and those of you who are virtually with us, I just want to thank you for your friendship and your support of the Bush Center. You're, you're truly the heart and soul of, of the Bush Center. Because of your support, the important work being carried out here is, is possible. You know, 2020 has certainly been a year that uh, is calling for flexibility and innovation. I can't tell you how proud I am of the t team here at the Bush Center that has continued to execute in such a meaningful way during these unprecedented and certainly challenging times. They have not slowed down, and I believe that the work is being done here is more important, quite frankly, than ever. The work of the Bush Center is built upon the principles, values, and core beliefs that have shaped President Bush's and Mrs. Bush's leadership and life of service. I want to tell you a quick story uh, about the fact that I've had a front row seat for the last 50 years to watch the transformative power of a compassionate leader, uh, a leader with a compassionate heart. If my wife was here, she would say she's watched it for over 65 years. Now, she would want to tell you the story about being on the safety patrol with him at Sam Houston Elementary and how he would stand up to the bullies on the playground in Sam Houston Elementary. From there, he moved, he went to Houston, Texas, where among the many, many things, he was involved in an inner city poverty program in the early 70s. From there, back to Midland, where he, at a very young age of 30, ran the campaign for the United Way, was involved in Bible study. From there, he went to Austin, where I can remember that so well because I remember singing the song, A Charge to Keep I Have at that inauguration, which the charge to keep was certainly at the center of his public service throughout his public service life. And it says, the charge to keep I have of God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. From there he went to DC where he set up and had a faith-based office in the White House just like he had done in Austin at, when he was governor. And that led to what's called the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, BETFAR. Think about this one. That saved over 17 million lives. It is absolutely, without a doubt, one of the greatest humanitarian program stories in the 250-year history of the United States of America. <laughs> that, and interestingly, I learned just last week that one of my great friends here in the United States has two grandchildren that were part of those more than 17 million lives that were saved. So I've seen the power of, and how contagious it can be to be one that's a leader with a compassionate heart. 
The principles that drive this place and work beyond here will affect change for generations to come. And inspired by that compassionate work and leadership, we are here to award the third annual George W. Bush Medal for Distinguished Leadership, an award created to recognize those who have made an impact on the global community and inspired others to do the same. President Bush has led a life in a way that has inspired others to take action and make impact. A passionate, trustworthy, compassionate, and honest, hardworking way, driven by unwavering principles like love your neighbor, like you'd like to be love yourself, to whom much is given, much is required. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome to the stage my friend, President George W. Bush. So thank you, Don. Thank you all. One of the beautiful things in life is friendship. And uh, I am proud that Don has been my friend for 50 years. And I'm not sure it'll be another 50, but uh, would you take 20? Uh, Laura and I are thrilled you're here. We want to thank Ken and Holly uh, for their leadership. You know, this is a really weird year, obviously. I mean, uh, generally, in an event like this, we'd be all crammed in together, and now we're socially distanced with masks. Uh, Hickey's never looked better. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, the Zoomers are watching, and we thank you very much. And as Don said, this program is thriving because of your support and your friendship. I want to thank our board members who are here, our Zooming, our advisory committee members who have helped so much. Uh, and I want to thank the Bush Center employees. Uh, you know, no matter how grave this year is, uh, you just got to know that those of us here at the Bush Center are incredibly optimistic about the future. Uh, yeah, we see challenges, but uh, we really see a place for our programs and the values they represent here at this center. As people grapple for a way forward uh, for our country, I think if they uh, look at the principles that guide our programs, they will see an optimistic future. And so we thank you very much for, uh, for supporting us. America at its best is a really good theme for tonight. You know, like uh, people look around and see America at its worst, not those of us in the Bush Center. We honor people who uh, care deeply about their fellow citizens and do something about it, like Hannah. Uh, the, uh, the LINK program is uh, really dear to my heart because early on in my presidency, I was studying uh, about North Korean escapees and the trauma they went through, all aiming to, to find freedom. And uh, here at the Bush Center, we're continuing that. And, and so, uh, Hannah, thank you and your team very much for, uh, for continuing the cause. One of the coolest guys I know is Joseph Kim a North Korean escapee whose story, by the way, is going to be in my book on immigration uh, coming out in March, uh, in case you want to bow to. And uh, uh, I, painted, I painted Joseph and told his story, but Hannah, Hannah knows a lot about people like Joseph Kim. And then Michael. Michael, uh, it's hard for people to really understand how dire the circumstances were Paul Quinn, and you essentially willed uh, the school to success. It's a, a remarkable sign of strong leadership. I'm so thrilled our friend Gerald Turner is uh, working with you and uh, in, in a collaborative effort. We at the Bush Center not only applaud you, we want to work with you as well. And so congratulations on uh, being not only a cool guy, but a really strong leader. And now it's my honor to award uh, uh, the, the award to Wendy Kopp. She, uh, I told Wendy earlier when I was talking to her that, uh, you know, we've had some uh, distinguished winners, one of whom could sing and she can't sing, and one of them who's rich and she's not rich. So she must have brought some, that would be Bono and Gates. And uh, so, so she had to bring something to the table. And what she brought to the table is educational entrepreneurship, the likes of which our country has never seen before. This is a woman who wanted to, uh, 
uh, help uh, close the opportunity gap in, in our country through uh, binding teachers uh, together in a, a cohesive way to help kids learn. And she did a fabulous job for Teach for America. There are now 62,000 alumni and core members all over our country, many of whom have stayed on after their two-year teaching commitment to take leadership roles in schools. Uh, Wendy now runs uh, the Teach for All uh, program. She was talking about the countries they are in and the difference she and her program uh, are making around the world. And so uh, tonight, the Distinguished Leadership Medal goes to a person who Laura and I have known for quite a while. Uh, it, she was reminding me that one time I put her on the campaign plane to fly from Los Angeles back to Dallas, where she was, I think Dallas, or somewhere. Anyway, um, we, uh, I had her at one of the State of the Union addresses. I gave her a, uh, an important uh, Distinguished Citizen Award. It turns out that in my speech, the farewell speech to the nation, which in 2008, a lot of people were kind of anxious to hear uh, that, that Wendy was invited. And so she was there. In other words, we've been close. And so it's a personal honor uh, to congratulate our friend and welcome uh, Wendy Kopp by Zoom to the Bush Center. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Um, this recognition really means so much, and I'm deeply honored to accept it on behalf of the thousands of people who have built Teach for America and now Teach for All, all the incredibly committed teachers who have gone to such great extents to help their students fulfill their potential, the change agents those teachers have become working at every level of the education system and policy and across sectors, the incredible social entrepreneurs around the world who are pioneering this approach in their countries, and of course the supporters and allies who have come behind us and challenged us and supported us each step of the way. And I, I have to thank the Bushes, President Bush and Mrs. Bush, who have done so much to champion this effort um, all along. Mrs. Bush as First Lady who traveled all across the country giving speeches on our behalf and visiting classrooms. Um, both of you who were such early proponents of the idea of Teach for All who saw the relevance and importance of this approach in, in other countries and introduced us even to the African First Ladies um, and, and then personally, it's been so moving to see you personally welcome each and every incoming cohort of Teach for America Corps members to Dallas, first to your home, now to your library. And what struck me since the first time I met you both is your incredibly deep conviction that all students in this country and around the world should have the opportunity to fulfill their potential. Um, as you know, we need to keep that commitment front and center if we're going to reach any of our aspirations. So again, um, on behalf of everyone in our community, thank you so much for, for your belief in the importance of this work. Uh, well spoken, Wendy. And now to interview Wendy. Not only does she get an award, she gets to be interviewed. <laughs> will be Holly Kuzmich. Holly, step four. Thanks, Wendy. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Hello, Wendy. Good to see you. Hi, Holly. So, to be here. Yeah, well, we're sad you can't be here in person, um, but we want to talk about the 30 years of work that you have done at Teach for America and Teach for All. So President Bush, you mentioned this. Teach for America has 62,000 alumni and core members in the United States, and Teach for All is 56 organizations on six continents. So the, the scope of what Wendy has done in the past 30 years is just amazing. When you think about how many kids she's touched around the world, 
through those two organizations. Wendy, can you talk a little bit? You grew up here in the Park Cities in Highland Park which is not a place that knows inequality very well. Um, and then you went to Princeton and you came up with the idea of Teacher America when you were at Princeton. What spurred you to come up with this idea? As you say, Holly, I mean, I did grow up in the bubble, um, really quite unaware of the diversity and disadvantage that exists in our country. Um, and then I went to Princeton where, of course, you can't begin to see the depths of, of inequity. But my freshman year roommate had gone to public school in the South Bronx, had overcome every odd to get to Princeton. And through her, I met the kind of community of first generation college students at Princeton. And I realized how differently prepared people were to be at Princeton based on where they happen to be born. And that was the first thing that clued me in. I was a public policy major, and I became more and more kind of fixated on just the inequities that exist in our country, a place that aspires so admirably to be a place of equal opportunity, but, but really, really isn't yet one. Um, so that, that was, that's what brought me to this. I think I got to my senior year and you know our generation was called the me generation. People thought we just all wanted to go work on Wall Street. Um, and I just thought that was a misnomer. I felt that our generation was just searching for a way to make a real difference in our country, to address the inequities in our country. Um, and I thought if those Wall Street banks can not bang down our doors and call upon us to commit just two years to work in their firms, we could do the same. We could call upon this generation to commit two years to teach in our most under-resourced communities. Um, and I became very obsessed with the idea, thinking that would, it would have a huge impact in those two years and that, that it would shape the priorities of a whole generation and shape their career paths and, and such. So that, that's where the idea came from. So I do want you to talk about the role of, you were of course having to do all of this right out of college. You were trying to create this organization, recruit graduates, figure out how to train them, figure out where to place them, but you had to raise money to do all of this. And I know that Ross Perot played a key role in getting your organization up and running. Can you tell that story? We really, I don't know that we would be here if it weren't for Ross Perot. Um, Thank heaven, first of all, Princeton had a senior thesis requirement and um, I decided to propose this idea in my thesis and the thesis became a plan for this and so I turn it in and my thesis advisor sees I, this very naive college senior thinks she's gonna create this. I mean, I had a budget in there saying we needed to raise two and a half million dollars for year one to recruit 500 people, which I thought ha we had to get 500 people in year one. So he calls me into his office and he says, you know, do you know how hard it is to raise even $2,500? Um, <clears throat> he introduces me to Princeton's development director to try to explain how outlandish this is. But I said, you know what? I think Ross Perot is gonna fund this. I didn't know Ross Perot, but I had grown up in Dallas watching the headlines and watching Ross Perot fight for education reform. And I knew he was such an entrepreneur and I thought he is gonna fund this. <laughs> so um, I wrote him 11 letters, which he, disputed. I mean, he told me he always responds the first time, but I, I was very persistent. And one day he called the office and I said, I'm coming to Dallas. Can I meet with you? And honestly, by that point, we, we actually had the 500 people signed up. Um, 2,500 of you know, people responded to a grassroots recruitment campaign. We had all these veteran teachers from urban and rural areas signed up to train them. We had school systems saying they would hire them. And we had raised something like $300,000 towards this two and a half million dollar goal. And I knew that this was my last chance. And I, I truly, I created an image in my head of myself glued to the chair in his office. I just said, I'm not leaving there until he agrees to give me a million dollars. And um, I went in and literally would not leave. He tried everything, introducing me to his friends. And I said, you know what, I've been down this path. You're the one. And he finally said, I'm sure to finally get me out, he said, I'll tell you what, if you can raise the other one and a half million, I'll give you 500,000. And 
I knew that's all I needed because I had met a lot of people and they were all just sitting on the fence and I knew that vote of confidence and sure enough. So one year after I graduated, I was looking out on an auditorium full of 500, the first 500 Teach for America Corps members. Um, and that's when the journey really began. But. Yeah. So, uh, Wendy, Teach for America is about placing teachers in schools to teach for two years, but it's really not just about teaching. You really created this to develop leaders. Talk, and I think a lot of people still don't even realize that about Teach for America. They think it's about placing teachers for two years, but talk about how you designed it and what you were really trying to do with your model. Yeah. You know, I probably myself couldn't have fully understood this, but from the beginning, there was a very big idea that, that this was going to have an immediate impact for students and a longer term impact. Like I thought it would change the consciousness of the country by shaping the values and the priorities of, of the generation of people whose first two years out of college would be teaching in low income communities instead of working in banks on Wall Street. Um, what I couldn't have probably known is just how transformational those two years are. There's actually a growing number of studies that consider that question, like what happens to these people during the two years, not only in the US, but now around the world. And we see such striking results, no matter which country these studies are done in, like the degree to which people's mindsets change. Like in the US, the bias reduction, like skin color bias reduction effect is greater than the difference in skin color bias between white folks and Latina folks. Um, so you see like really significant, I mean, it's hard to find interventions that reduce bias to that extent. So the degree to which people come out of this believing more in the potential of kids and communities, their understanding of the nature of the problem completely shifts. They come in thinking funding is the solution. It's a, always a technical solution. And they come out thinking this is a very complex, adaptive, problem and is going to require a lot of, of different aspects of the solution. Um, and their priorities change. They never leave the work. 86% of those 60 plus thousand Teach for America alumni are still in and around the work. Two thirds of them full time in education, another 20% in policy or in other related sectors, but working to expand opportunity for kids and families in low income communities. And we've seen the same effects around the world. 73% are full time in education of all these folks who've finished their two year commitments in all these countries around the world. So talk a little bit, let's, let's move to Teach for All, which you started in 2008. What made you decide, okay, I've built this in the United States, I wanna take this global, and how did you go about doing that? Because when you're working in 56 countries, it looks very different in each one of those countries. So how did, yeah. how did you approach that? So I was not thinking about the rest of the world. I had my head down. I was fully focused on the US, you know, trying to get bigger and better and address the very significant issues that persist in our country. Um, what happened was that there was something in the water in the rest of the world. I mean, literally 15 years ago, it, within the span of one year, I had met people from 13 countries, from India to China to Chile to, you know, many places who were just determined that something similar had to happen in their countries. And they were looking for help. And as overwhelmed as I was at, at Teach for America, I came to think that we needed to be responsive to that. And so that led to the launch of Teach for All and really inspired the design of Teach for All as a network of independent, locally led, governed organizations. And now, believe it or not, we've had two launches in the last week. We're in 58 countries with another 30 in the pipeline. Um, and it's just been, the Teach for All journey has, has, has been way, it's really opened my mind to the possibilities of taking a global approach because there are so many incredibly committed, I always say like the hearts, minds, and souls drawn to this work, it's just the same, no matter, I could be in Afghanistan or Pakistan or, you know, Nigeria or the next place. And it's just like, I feel like I'm with the same people I've been working with for 30 years, like the people who are drawn to this and they're so brilliant and they're inspired by a diversity of cultures and contexts, which leads them to think in different ways and to innovate. 
you know, with a global organization that's just all about helping everyone learn from each other. So we're moving much faster now that we're, we are a global network and, and can learn from, from Teach for America and Teach for America is learning from, you know, Teach for India and others, so. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanna, now that you've been doing this, uh, both domestically and around the world, and you've been, you know, you've got these tens of thousands of alumni, you know, you take people who don't, uh, who aren't education majors and put them in schools. And so you have to figure out how to train them and get them ready to go in front of a classroom pretty quickly. I'm curious to know, after the tens of thousands of teachers you've, you've trained and seen, um, in classrooms ac across America and around the world. What have you learned about preparing people to teach? What should we be thinking about as we prepare teachers? First, it's incredibly challenging. Um, you know, I would say what we've learned is that the most successful teachers are extraordinary leaders. So, first we need to focus on recruiting and selecting people with the personal characteristics um, and the commitment necessary to, to be an extraordinary leader for kids. Um, and I think that that's where it starts. Um, we have seen that the most important part of a teacher's development happens in their schools. So I think Teach for America's model and Teach for All's approach of you know, intensively preparing people during an initial, say, six to eight week training institute, but then that's just the beginning of a two year program of ongoing support and professional development. Um, you know, all these teachers, all of them actually across our network are clustered in schools and they have ongoing coaching and mentoring from veteran teachers. And I think if you look at the studies on teacher education, um, you know, our, the greatest impact is, is in investments in ongoing development of teachers. So, um, Wendy, I'm curious to know what, given how long you've been at this, where, you know, in education, it's hard to sometimes see progress. Nationally, it's hard to see much progress, especially lately in the United States, but that doesn't mean there isn't progress happening. And I want you to talk about where you've seen progress, especially over the decades, when you first started to where you are now. And what does that progress look like? I'm, I'm so excited about that question, Holly, um, because I think, I think we are lacking historical perspective in our country when it comes to education. And you know, I'm, I'm constantly hearing people say that we've, we've made no progress. And um, I guess from my perspective, you know, it's actually, it's just not true. I mean, one of the markers for me is that my senior year in college, one of the hit movies was Stand and Deliver. Um, and as some of you may know, I mean, it, it took a heroic teacher, um, Jaime Escalante, and, and who had coached a class of kids to, to score fives on the AP calculus exam, um, and it made a hero of him. And in fact, it was a true story. ETS did not believe the results. Um, and when the folks in Hollywood heard this story, the, you know, their response, I mean, we didn't send a bunch of researchers to his classroom to say, what's he doing differently so that we can propagate this? No, they said, this is like such a charismatic guy, let's make a movie out of it. And it's such a marker for me because over these now three decades in the US, um, just to focus here for a bit, you know, I've seen the propagation of not only many, many more classrooms like Jaime Escalante's, but literally hundreds of schools that are truly transformational for kids. We wouldn't make another movie because they're actually commonplace now. I mean, it's hard to find a community. Dallas has many of them that are taking kids whose background might predict one set of outcomes, but are putting them on a trajectory to you know, graduate from college at much even higher than the national average. Um, so what I've seen is that if you look at the national data, um, you know, it's not as good as we would all hope, but what you see is that some communities are making a lot of progress. And so I think we need to start looking at what are, what's different in those communities. So I think about Dallas. I mean, Dallas was one of the places where we felt progress was least likely to happen for many, many years until maybe a decade ago. It's now the fastest improving 
you know, urban district in the state of Texas. You know, the number of schools that are on like Texas's failing list went from 40 10 years ago to, you know, single digits today. Um, and I would say, like, once you look at what is different about the Dallases, the Chicago's, the Newark's, the New Orleans's, many, many other communities that are making really dramatic progress for kids, I would say it's there's there's a lot of leadership in those communities. It's not one superintendent, although, you know, superintendents are very important, but it's a critical mass of people exerting leadership from around the whole ecosystem around kids. It's incredibly you know, motivated and committed teachers. It's school leaders who are on a mission to build transformational schools. It's people on school boards and in the system itself and students themselves um, at, you know, raising their voices. It's their parents. So where we can build collective leadership at the local level, we see progress. Um, and I, I think we look for the quick fix or the intervention or like, what's the answer to education? Like, what's the one thing? And I've seen there's no one thing. Mm -hmm. It takes so much, you know, like I could go on and on about how much it takes. This is a big systemic problem, but what, what affects systemic change? Leadership. And so that, that's really the core of our belief. Like we need to take a really intentional approach to cultivating the leadership we need to solve this problem. And it's completely within our control. Yeah. So now that you've been doing this work globally, I'm curious to know what you've learned in your, in your global work at Teach for All, number one, and what have you learned that we all should be thinking about in the U.S. that we just aren't, that, that you've now kind of gathered in your work in other countries? Mm. Um, well, one thing I've seen that's been surprising to me. I mean, when I started the Teach for All journey, I just was telling myself over and over. In fact, I was really, the first time I got on a plane, was, which was to go to India, I had a total crisis of conscience, just thinking like, what do I have to share with these folks? I mean, India is so different. Um, but it was on that visit and every visit subsequently when I realized you know, the roots of the issues we're addressing, like the challenges facing the most marginalized kids are eerily similar from place to place. In fact, their circumstances are much more similar to each other's than to the more privileged kids in their countries. And I was really depressed by that for, for a good while. Like I thought we're just fighting the forces of gravity everywhere. I was seeing the same patterns playing themselves out. Even the politics are similar. Um, hmm. And until I realized the silver lining is the solutions are shareable. We could be moving so much faster if we were, if we had lots of committed leaders in local communities, because this transformational change will not happen without deeply rooted local leadership, but who are part of networks globally so that they can learn from each other. So that instead of just all these pockets of excellence, we can start like moving faster. And so that that's one of the biggest things I've learned. So we now have you know, thousands of teachers and alumni from all these different countries in communities of practice learning from each other. I mean, even in this COVID moment, especially, um, how do we reopen schools better? How do we teach without internet and reach kids? How do we, you know, so that's one thought. And it's no one thing that, that we've learned, I would say, um, but it's just realizing that, you know, when you pull yourself up from your, your bubble, you start looking at the world with a broader perspective. Um, so I'll say one other thing, which is that I think being part of this global work, you know, there were so many thoughtful reflections coming from all over the world asking us, like, an excellent education to what end? I mean, we had this vision, all children should have the chance to attain an excellent education. And you know, the conversation around really what do we mean by excellent education became became so loud. And, and I think it's louder, actually, in many other countries than I've experienced it here. And it really led us to step back and ask ourselves. You know, we came together across our network in a process asking ourselves, what's the big vision? Like, by 25 years from now, what will we all accomplish together? And we started thinking about where will the world be in 25 years? You know considering how much the economy is changing, considering what's happening to our planet, 
you know, considering the increasingly complex challenges that we seem to be facing, and we realized if we're not developing the students in our classrooms as leaders who can navigate the changing economy and solve our increasingly complex problems, there's actually no hope for any of us or to reach any of our aspirations. And that really reoriented my whole thinking and our whole approach towards saying, how do we foster students' agency, um, their you know, social emotional skills, um, you know, the mindsets, the values necessary to ensure that the kids today are gonna be ready to lead us differently tomorrow. I, I think this is the key to everything in, in the world, actually. So I want to ask you a quick question about COVID and the pandemic and hear from you. We can all see sort of the challenge that this is presenting literally every single day as school districts here and around the world are having to figure out, you know, how, how to do school. Um, but what do you also think maybe over the longer term are some of the opportunities that might come out of this? Because I, I think there are some. It's forcing people to do things in different ways, which is always a bit of a learning experience. So what do you see as things that might actually be good in the long run in education? Yeah. First of all, there's never been a stronger sense that we need to be learning from each other across borders. And I think that's no small thing. Um, you know. Everyone realizes, actually, let's look at what, what are they doing in these countries that have experienced this before us. And we've never seen more appetite for that. And I truly put it very high on the list of what would speed up progress. I mean, very interestingly, we've, we've actually engaged, you know, the gentleman who really led the revolution and the transformation of education in Shanghai. Um, also the, one of the ministers who really led the revolution over many years in Finland. And it was very, I mean, I still think about this because we asked them, what is the key? And both of them, different years, different environments, said the same thing. Number one, we took a global approach. We sent our educators abroad. So I think there's just something in this. Like we need to really reconsider our relationship to the global community and what we can learn. Um, that's one thought. The second, and I know this will be obvious, but you know, we have been brought out of our inertia in terms of using technology as a teaching tool. And um, you know, it's very interesting because in in our work, we've spent a lot of energy trying to help teachers move from a model that we all grew up with, where the teacher is the stage on a stage, you know, and is just transmitting information towards one where teachers are facilitators of learning. Um, and we've seen the power of technology. I mean, that technology has, has made that transition overnight. So just to share one example, um, in most of our, you know, most parts of the world, um, if we're lucky, kids can access one phone, maybe with some data. I mean, that's, you know, not all kids have that much access, but in Pakistan, as one example, there's an amazing teacher named Rabia Shadri, who is teaching two classes of 50 girls. And um, you know, she found a way to make sure each of her kids could have access to a phone. And she started what she calls a WhatsApp school. And so each day, you know, she sends instructional videos, assignments, and you know, she basically says, "We will never go back. Like we can't wait to come back together. We love each other, but." my kids are learning so much more. I mean, I'm, she said, I'm watching, some of my kids are watching those videos multiple times. Like, you know, so it enables this level of differentiation. She's like, they asked me their individual questions. You know, I could never meet all of their needs when they were just all in one room. She said, it's given parents visibility into what we're doing. It's led to a different level of student ownership. Um, so I think we've definitely seen the possibilities. I'm very daunted by the challenge of how will we leverage technology in an equitable way and how will we ensure the teacher transformation that will be necessary to make the most of it because it requires more of teachers and not less to use technology well. And so we shouldn't think like technology will therefore make it much easier right. for teachers. No, it makes it much harder. We will yeah. need to figure out how to recruit and develop teachers differently if we're going to you know, really make the most of what we've learned in this era about the power of technology as a learning tool. Yeah. 
So, Wendy, I want to talk a little bit about you and your own leadership. Um, I mean, you, st you started TFA when you were right out of college and now, you know, have been doing this for a while. What would you, what have you learned about yourself in those 30 years as a leader and or what advice would you give to yourself back when you were starting this out that you know now? <laughs> um, well, I've definitely learned I, I, one thing I know I can do is persevere. And what I've learned over many years is that, you know, what it doesn't matter if you fail on one day or make many, many mistakes. What matters is that you get where you're trying to go in the end. Um, and I think I've just developed over time a confidence that with enough perseverance, we'll get there. Um, so I guess I'd tell my 22-year-old self that, like, it's all going to work out. Just keep going at it and keep looking for allies and building relationships um, because no one can get where you're trying to go alone. Yeah. Where do you want Teach for All to be in 10 years or 20 years? Um, you know, I guess what we're working towards at Teach for All is the day when we have whole communities in every part of the world that are showing people what's possible. Because we've really learned that we need to take a local approach. Um, you know, national policies matter. In fact, what President Bush did to make every student visible and in schools and in school data was crucial and provided an environment that enables local progress. But ultimately, the only way to make progress is to have enough, a critical mass of people in a, in, a, in a community. And so that is what we're working towards across Teach for All. And I hope to see you know, an ever-growing network of organizations in every part of the world that are developing the collective leadership necessary to ultimately realize that, that vision of a day when whole communities and ultimately a whole world is enabling all kids to have the education, the support, the opportunity to shape a better future for, for themselves and, and for all of us. Um, so Wendy, I want to end on this. You know, one of the, you know, one of your, your core beliefs in creating Teacher America was that you were developing leaders who you wanted to stay in the world of education. And you talked about how many of them are still doing that. I should mention that we have several TFA alum who work here at the Bush Institute and work on education policy. So they're, that, they're part of that statistic you mentioned. But you've also had, you were really sort of one of the people that started this social entrepreneurship model in education because your TFA alum went on to found KIPP and Yes Prep and Idea Public Charter Schools and Rocket Ship. Did you envision sort of how far that would go when you first started in this work? You know, um, I guess as I kind of shared at the beginning, there was a big idea at the beginning. I mean, at the very front end, you know, was like, and, and, you know, in a way I was inspired by the Peace Corps thinking, you know, the idea behind the Peace Corps, it, it was to make a difference during two years, but there was a much bigger idea. And, you know, the bigger idea was we're going to, there's an idea power to this. We're going to change people's understanding of our place in the world, et cetera. Um, and that was the idea initially. I don't think I could have envisioned how it would play out. The fact that so many people would commit themselves to working from within education. You know, from the beginning, I knew this was a deeply systemic problem, and I thought people will teach for two years and then they'll take this on from every vantage point, like strengthening economies in urban and rural areas and, you know, changing our legal structures, et cetera. But I think we've seen how much we can do within education. Um, so I, I don't, I couldn't have envisioned how it would play out exactly. I certainly could not have envisioned the global work. It never occurred to me. Um, but it's the, my greatest source of inspiration is honestly the unbelievably committed teachers and the alumni educators who make this their life's work and go at it every day in partnership with so many others in, in the communities in which they're working. Well, Wendy, congratulations. You're really deserving of this medal. Um, and so many of us have worked with you for so long and just appreciate all that you've done in the United States and around the world on behalf of kids. So thank you. Thank you so much.
Holly and Kim for all your support. Well, thank you to all of our uh, Forum on Leadership sponsors tonight. We're so appreciative of your support. Um, at some point, we look forward to hosting larger crowds here safely at the Bush Center again soon. Uh, our next Forum on Leadership is April 15th, 2021, so please mark that date on your calendar. Thank you all for the support and generosity you provide to our work here at the Bush Center. We hope you and your loved ones remain safe and healthy. Thank you, and good evening.